Let's always stand, if you will, as we join together in the worship together. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. We're glad that you're here today, if you're visiting with us. We're glad that you chose to be a part of our worship assembly today. Uh, we'd invite our members and our visitors to stay for Bible class. And then after uh, Bible class, we'll have our first Sunday luncheon. We've got plenty of food, so if you didn't bring anything, just eat my stuff. It'd be fine. Yeah, hold on. So we're, we're hope you'll stay with us and glad that you're here today. I uh, just want to give you a couple of updates. Um, on Friday night, Bryce Gage had to go to the ER here uh, in Marble Falls with something similar that he was had up in uh, New Mexico and with some heart issues, he thought. He's got COVID, and they think that COVID's causing the blood pressure issue. So he's resting at home today. And so let's remember Bryce and Shannon and Jenny Lynn and their family. Also, a big thank you to everybody who helped with uh, Back to School Blast uh, on Saturday and on Thursday. Uh, we hauled 1,500 pairs of shoes and gave over 1,000 pairs of shoes away yesterday and hauled the rest of them back. So anyway, thank you all for that. And, uh, plus gave away about 1,200 backpacks, so we're 
we're grateful for that. Uh, also, uh, our group's back from Tuba City and had a good mission trip and glad they made it back safely. And I think um, a lot of windshield time between here and Tuba City, Arizona, driving, but it was good. And also, you know, this is Aaron's last Sunday with us, so I know we said, kind of officially said goodbye to him and Emily uh, a couple of weeks ago as, uh, on a Wednesday night. But make sure you uh, send to him the hand of fellowship. Uh, we're going to miss him, miss him very much uh, here. So, um, anyway. well, Jesus has invited us to the table uh, to be uh, one with him and as a body and with his body and his blood and to remember and to give praise and thanksgiving for what he has done and what he continues to do for us. And we're glad that you're here. Chris Bridges has our shepherd's prayer and Chris, amen, will lead our worship. Good morning. <clears throat> so good to see everyone here. I was handed a note this morning. Uh, Patty Dishman is requesting prayers for her daughter-in-law, Adelaide. She's in St. Luke's Hospital in Houston with complications from COVID, flu, and seizures. <clears throat> and we need to uh, pray that the doctors can actually uh, find what's wrong with her. Would y'all bow with me? Dear God, what just a wonderful day you've given us this morning. Father, it's the day we set aside to come together and worship you as a church here, Father. And what uh, we just pray that our worship is pleasing, Father, and that our hearts are good as we worship you. And Father, we just go in prayer now. We know that we have several here that are hurting at the loss of loved ones the family of Sharon Hall, of uh, Jerry and Carolyn Edwards, and the Phelps family at the loss of Sheila Thomas. And Father, we're just thankful that Tony Hall, or Tony King, got to pass on to you. Father, we know that she had been looking for this for quite some time, and we know that the angels are rejoicing to have her in heaven. Father, we know that we have many people that are dealing with cancer, with Kimberly Priest, Tom Washburn, Ginger Tron, and Father, we know that there are others. We just want to lift these people up to you by name, Father, and just uh, give them healing. Uh, and Father, there's so many now that are coming down with COVID again. And Father, we just want to pray for them. Uh, it seems like the, the numbers are picking up, Father. And we pray that it's not severe. Father, we have so many also that are struggling with being at home who can't get out. Uh, Father, let us be hands that can go to them and, and reach out to them and uh, just be with them sometimes, Father. We know that people just need other people. Father, we just want to pray also for Patty Dishman and for her daughter, Adelie, as she uh, struggles. Uh, we just pray that the doctors can find what's wrong with her. Father, we all have struggles in our life of one kind or another. You know what that struggles are, and each of us know what the struggles are that we have. And we just pray today, Father, that we can overcome these things that are in our life to keep us from truly being what we should and help us as Christians to help those around us, Father. Father, at the end, what we're looking for is to be Christ-like so that we can have that home in heaven with you. And we're all in this together, Father, and we all need each other's help. Father, as we continue to worship this morning, we just pray that uh, we empty our hearts to you, Father, that we love you, and Father, we know that you love us. As through your Son's name we pray, amen.
دعوت میں God, we come before you, the most powerful on high, the creator of this earth, the designer of all things. God, we have, we always have something to worry about in this world. We have troubles. This is a broken humanity. But Lord, we serve you. And for that reason, Lord, we can have faith and know that all things are in your hands, out of our control. But we are so thankful, Lord, that we can be called your children. that you have adopted us. And Lord, we can take so much comfort in that. Lord, we, we thank you for this church. We pray for strength for every soul here. And Lord, we pray for the kids as they go back to school that they will there will be lights in the, those hallways, that there will be lights in those classrooms, that they, that they know that, that they can spread your message as youth amongst their peers. They can spread your word. Give them courage, Lord, to, to do what's right, to stand up for you to say your name. Lord, we pray that as we sing these songs to you, that as we speak to you this morning, as we hear from your word that we are at peace, that we put all of our, our chores in the back of our mind, that we are just able to, to be here with you, that we can relax. And take advantage of this time to, to be with, with other Christians and, and hear from your word and, and just be. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending your son down here to, to live amongst us, to be persecuted, to be spat upon, to have that crown of thorns placed on his head to be crucified and then say, forgive them. Lord, what, what powerful love. And we pray, Lord, that we can spread that love to, to others, that we have that same patience with others. Lord, we thank you so much for, for having patience with us. And we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.
understanding through this song and scripture of all. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates those. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. The Lord says, let us now come together. Let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, 
they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, your sins shall be like white wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the lamb. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You may be seated. Perry Mason, Matlock, L.A. Law, Allie McBill, Suits, all those legal shows, right? They all kind of follow the same pattern. It's kind of good theater to watch, right? And then O.J. came along, and it got real. And we watched trials, and we watch them live now, right? And we just saw a defamation suit between celebrities and a conspiracy theory suit that's going on east of us. And we watch trials on criminal trials on television, streamed live now. They all kind of follow the same pattern, right? Whether it's the show, the TV shows, or real life. Camera comes on, judge is in the frame, and you hear the bailiff say, all rise, honorable so-and-so, so-and-so presiding. Camera pans out in the courtroom, and there is the plaintiff attorneys and their party, or maybe the prosecuting attorney on one side, kind of square-jawed, clenched, ready to go, and on the other side, you got the defense attorney and the defense team and the defendant with this sheepish grin on their face like I know something you don't know and trial proceeds and whether again it's TV or real life and witnesses come before and somewhere in the midst of a trial, right, you get one of those moments, <sighs> right, surprise witness, new discovery, tipping point in the trial, courtroom goes a little crazy, judge gets his gavel, order in the court, order in the court. And I guess, you know, if you've ever been in a trial, that's not much fun, but they kind of make it look fun on TV, right? In Isaiah chapter 1, there is a trial that's going on. It's different. It's not noisy. No TV cameras. Not a defense team and a prosecuting team. Just two people. It's God who is judge, prosecutor, and jury, and the covenant community of Judah, who is the defendant. And God brings forth, and he comes in and brings forth the charges against his people. In the first part of Isaiah chapter 1, they're rebellious. Not like teenage rebellion, like really rebellious, right? And they're willfully ignorant of God, choosing not to understand and hear what God would have to say. They got a really bad ethic going on. Sinful. Moral compass is way off base. These are God's people, by the way. They have despised God through idolatry and through neglecting of the, the vulnerable and the marginalized and their oppressing people and in all this context that's going on in Isaiah, Sennacherib is closing in on Jerusalem and Judah is trying to make deals and God's brought them to court in the midst of war. God brings the people to court because their worship is stale and it's perfunctory, and it's just checking the boxes, and it's looking, hey, look at us. We're the covenant people. And God says, your sacrifices stink. Your incense are no good to me. Your heart's not in the right place when you get together. And here's the thing. Judah knows she's guilty. That's why there's no defense attorney. 
The actions are so egregious that there is no defense for them. They're all out there. And so God in this, in, this, in Isaiah in chapter 1, brings forth this courtroom scene, and God's at the bench, and Judah's standing over there at the defendant's table, and God gives those. Come on up. Stand before the bench. Now, if you've ever been in a place where you had to stand before the bench, you know what's coming next, right? You're about to hear the verdict, and you're about to get the sentence, and it's probably not going to be good for you. So in this courtroom scene, Judah is metaphorically brought before the throne of God or the bench of God, and I kind of get this idea it gets really quiet. Judah's wringing her hands. I know I'm guilty. What's the sentence going to be? So God the judge announces the sentence, and it's very unorthodox. No mention of time served. No mention of court cost. No mention of fines. God says... Your snow and your wool. What? Yeah. Your snow and your wool. You're guilty, but forgiven. You're going to face some trials and some hardship, but you're resourced. And can you imagine the look on Judah's face. What did he just say? Snow and wool? How about fire and brimstone, God? That's what we deserve. No, snow and wool. Oh yeah, there is a caveat. There is a little probation caveat here. You need to let me change you. You need to be transformed you got to think a little bit differently. By the way, God pronounces snow and wool not because Judah deserved it. Not because Judah could merit it or do enough things to, to get things right. God pronounces snow and wool because God is gracious and merciful. But as uh, our grumpy old man's group is studying on Tuesday morning, we're studying Bonhoeffer's call to discipleship. Grace is not cheap. It's free, but it's not cheap. Cheap grace says you're forgiven and keep on doing what you're doing. God's grace says you're forgiven. Let's be changed people. Let's be transformed people. And so what God is saying is, my people, us, we're snow and wool people. We're not the same. We've been transformed. Our minds have been changed. If not, we're not snow and wool people. And then God begins to describe in Isaiah 1 what snow and wool people really look like. These snow and wool people, when they come together to worship, This is not some check-the-box, perfunctory, get-my-ticket-punch-till-next-Sunday thing. Church, we are in the presence honoring the name of the Almighty God. We are here to remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are here because the Spirit of God dwells in us. This is not some perfunctory thing that we do. This is something that we we should long to do. I mean, we should want to be here. Shouldn't we? It doesn't matter who's leading worship. It doesn't matter who's preaching. We should want to be here because God is here and Jesus is here and the Spirit's here. It does matter how you think. It does. Snow and wool people, when they come together to worship God, this is not just something that we do. This is who we are. It's what we look like. Our worship is meaningful and it's powerful and we're engaged. 
And we're here for each other. That's what we look like. Snow and wool people are people who are self-aware. Aware of our own sinfulness, but also aware of that we are forgiven. So God says, listen, I'm not going to hear your prayers and your offerings anymore because your hands are bloody. That is, you've got sin on your hand. Snow and wool people are confessional. Listen, we don't always get it right. Our heads are not always in the right place. Our hearts are not always in the right place. Our hands do things, right? Our feet go places that that aren't always aligned with God. But when we're self-aware and confessional, we can confess those sins and can name those sins. They can't control us. We're aware. We're aware. And being aware, we're humbled by the fact that God would dare forgive us. And we live accordingly. And part of that living accordingly is, is Isaiah goes through this and gives us this. We are changed, right? No more evil. Learn to do good. Be beneficial. Be helpful. Be mindful of others. In spite of our, you know, little egocentric selves, uh, we are not the center of the universe. I know that disappoints you all. It disappoints me greatly every time I say that out loud. Look, when we are these people that have been cleansed, that have been purified by the power of God, what we learn to do is to be beneficial to others. And you know what? This is where grace is not cheap because that's going to cost you something. It may cost you money, it may cost you time, it may cost you a lot of emotional stress and pain, it may make you uncomfortable, it may wear you out, you may not get to sleep, you may have to pray without ceasing for hours upon end, you may have to put up with snarky people. (gasps) Imagine. Be beneficial to others. That's snow and wool people. Snow and will people seek justice and correct oppression and bring justice and hope to those who are the most vulnerable in this world. It's not just about playing fair. It's about being equitable. We level the playing field. It's not just about treating everybody the same. It is elevating those who are the most vulnerable and the most oppressed. It is speaking for those who are voiceless. It is being the hands and feet for those who cannot help themselves for whatever the situation is in their life. And as we think about people that we serve and that we help and that we minister to in the name of Jesus, it's never that we never look at others as lesser than. That old, oh, bless your sweetheart thing that we do sometimes. Snow and wool people see needs and meet needs to whatever ability God has given us. And I believe this, church, when we're going to go and serve others in the name of the Lord, God's going to empower us to do what we need to do. If we will let God do God's work and get out of God's way for a minute. I'm too tired. That's too far. Do you know how much gas is? We know. God knows. Go anyway. Go anyway. That's snow and more people. So he brings this lawsuit to a close, Isaiah does. Come, let us reason together. Let us hear it. Who are you people? Well, you're snow and wool people. People cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. People made whole by the Spirit of God. People who find direction in the Word of God. Snow and wool people, when we gather for worship today, as we've done today, we gather here. We don't come before the bench. We come before the table. And the table speaks to us. And the table calls us to be these snow and wool people that is described in Isaiah chapter 1. And to come and commune with one another and to build each other up in God's holy faith and to hear the word of the Lord being spoken through psalms and prayers and preaching 
and at table. And not only to hear it, but to embrace it and to let the Word of God just infiltrate our bodies to the point that we can't help but go out and proclaim it to others through word and deed. We come before the table and Jesus says, Who are you? Jesus, we're your snow and wool people. We're the ones you've cleansed. We're the ones you've died for. We're the ones who count it a blessing to be able to come to your table, who count it as a privilege to be able to come and worship you. That's who we are. We're people who don't just live out the faith for two hours at a time on a Sunday morning. We're people who live out our faith every day of, of every week, of every month, and every year. And every opportunity that Jesus gives us to proclaim His name through word and deed, we take advantage of. Because God gives us those opportunities. That's part of being a self-aware people. That's who we are. I don't know what expectations you had today coming here. My expectation every Sunday is that I'm going to meet God here. And God's going to whack me upside the head when He needs to and hug my neck when it needs to be hugged and correct me when I need to be corrected and lift me up when I'm feeling down because God's people are here. Snow and wool people are servants of God who have been changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Who are not going to be like they were. Who are not going to be afraid and live in fear. Who are not going to be self-centered but those who are going to be other-minded and led completely by the will and Spirit of God. That's who we are. Jesus says, come before my table. Learn of me. Commune with me. Go be me to the world. Snow and wool. That's a weird sentence, isn't it? We stand guilty before the bench and stand cleansed before the table. Let's go be snow and wool people. If you hadn't been cleansed, you have that opportunity this morning uh, to come and to confess Jesus as the Son of God, to die to self, to change your mind. That's what repentance means, to change your mind. And to be buried with Him in death and baptism, to be raised as Jesus was raised, to be cleansed. You can't cleanse yourself of sin, but Jesus can. And that song that we sang, although our sins are many, His mercy is more. Right? Paul says that in Romans 5, that where there is sin, grace abounds. But the change for snow and wool people, he asked this question in Romans 6, 1, should we continue in sin that grace should abound? Heaven forbid. Why? Because you're new. You're snow and wool. And that opportunity will be yours. Never done that. Now, if you have and just things you need help with. Part of what snow and wool people do is walk alongside each other and encourage each other and support each other and love one another and serve. And so if you have a need this morning, please see one of the elders at the back of the auditorium. Let's stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood.
Patrick is unable to be here this morning, and I'm Jim Myers, I'm substituting for him, so if you'd bear with me, we'll talk about some things that might be appropriate as we think about the Lord's Supper and what it means to us. You know, there are events in our life that we remember many, many years after uh, they occurred. It's amazing, the older you get, I can't hardly remember what I did last week, but I remember what I did in the first grade, which is kind of strange. But one of the things that I remember is the first new car that I ever bought. And it was a 1968 Chevy 2. Now, probably that most of you don't even know what a Chevy 2 was, but they eventually changed the name of that car to a Nova, so that uh, give you some perspective. But buying the car was really special for a newlywed couple. And it was really wonderful until we received the GMAC pay book in the mail. You remember those pay books? They had uh, coupons in there and you, well, every month there was a coupon for every month and you'd tear it out and write your check and mail it in. And when we got that book, you know, it was about that thick. I said, oh me, you know, I don't think we'll ever pay for this car. But as time went on, we finally worked it down and. And finally, after about 35 months, uh, the last coupon came out of that book. We wrote the check and sent it in, and boy, you know, our debt paid our debt to be free of debt on that now old car. But, uh, you, you know, that's uh, an important thing to think about, being debt free. And if you turn to John chapter 19, verse 30, the text says, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The last words that he spoke. Now, it's my understanding that the original Greek, that phrase, it is finished, can be translated, the debt is paid. And I think that is probably a more appropriate translation to me because I think it, it really catches the issue there that what Jesus was saying, the debt is paid. And we need to remember that really Jesus came to cancel our debts. He came to cancel our debts. Jesus forced himself to re endure the cross, the agony that he endured on that cross until he had paid for every sin we commit. He took our sins upon himself and paid our penalty in full. You know, it's amazing we can get excited for paying off a debt to some credit agency, and yet oftentimes we forget the greatest debt we will ever owe. The debt of our sin has been completely paid in full 
by the sacrificial atonement of the body and blood of Christ. You know, the cup and the bread this morning really serve reminders that the only real debt Christians owe today is a debt of gratitude and thanksgiving, not to some creditor, but to a savior. Let's pray. Father, we are humbled as we come before you this morning, thanking you for Jesus and for what he was willing to do for us. Father, as we break this bread this morning, we want to remember him and his body and what happened to it on that day and what it means to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, as we continue this memorial, we pray that you would be mindful of the tremendous price that was paid for us. How all those accusations against us were nailed to the cross. Father, we're so thankful for the blood that was shed for us and we want to appreciate how precious it was. Father, we thank you as we partake of this cup, as we, it is a reminder of us that blood that was shed. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, among all our troubles today in this world, we are still mightily blessed, every one of us. And certainly, according to the world standards, we're, we're, that one, we're, the, we're the one percent, okay? We're, that's who we are. And we need to appreciate that and recognize who gave us the ability to be that one percent and understand that what we have is things that are just temporary ours but really don't belong to us at all. That God has just put us in charge as his stewards. And our responsibility is to manage the things that he gave us in a responsible way that glorify his name. So we have a chance this morning to give back uh, some of those blessings. There's many ways to do that. You can do it online, you can do it by direct deposit, you can do it in the trays out in the hall. So let's think about our blessings this morning as we prepare to give back. Let us pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the tremendous blessings you pour upon us. We just pray, Father, that we would recognize that, uh, that these things are, are temporary and belong to you. And it's our responsibility, Father, to use them in a way that to, to expand your kingdom and to glorify your name in all that we do. Father, thank you for these blessings. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen.
Ten years. A lot happens in ten years, right? I went from 50 to 60. <laughs> I went from an elementary kid to a college kid. And we had this fledgling little thing called children's ministry that went from a subset of education to a powerful juggernaut because of this lady named Lisa Bray. So Ms. Bray, come up. And you can bring your family too. See, we didn't really forget. Y'all can come up too. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Let me tell you, this lady does so much for this church that none of you know about, and so much to, for our staff and, and for our kids especially. And listen, we need to honor people who are worthy of honor. And, and uh, we kind of made a no big deal about her 10th anniversary on Monday. We got to just blew it off, and so <laughs> it was a call to this. So, uh, kids, I know y'all have something for Miss Lisa if y'all come up, and Bob uh, and our staff if y'all come up. And then elders, if you'll join, so. I'll let you hold these for her. Bob, if you would like to present. Listen, the impact that Lisa's had on this church is, is far-reaching. Uh, so from, you know, this guy who was in her program and all the things she's done and this right here and what she's done to our family. So uh, thank her today and hug her today and uh, thank God for her today because we do uh, every single day. I know Kyle's going to pray for us. Father, we come to you this morning in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the service that Lisa brings to this church, to this community of believers. And we thank you so much for her presence, for her thoughtfulness, for her leadership, and for her encouragement. And Father, we thank you so much that we have her as part of our team. She makes this church stronger, and we thank you for that. Father, help us to be encouragers to her, to say thanks, and, and to celebrate this day because of the, uh, her dedication over these past 10 years. Father, we're thankful for all of our staff, and uh, help us today, too, as we say uh, so long to Aaron as, as he departs from our our family, but Father, we thank you for all that he's always uh, done for this, uh, for the kids too. Father, we're so blessed, and, and we just ask that you would continue to bless us and, and help us uh, today as, uh, as we encourage and, and celebrate uh, Lisa and what she means to this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks to all of the parents who helped uh, arrange for the, the gifts as well. Let's all be standing for our closing song this time. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again. 